Hello, welcome everyone. Just getting started with this session. I am Chiara, your host today. And today we're going to have uh, Simon Ritter from Azul and our Jakarta EE expert, Lukman. I see the number of participants is starting to increase. I'll give it a few more minutes and then we're going to start. And just a few practical points before starting. Um, so this will be quite an interactive session where Lukman and Simon will be sharing their expertise. Um, feel free to ask questions through the chat function at any time. Um, and we'll be monitoring it throughout the entire uh, session. If you're having issues with the chat, just let me know and we'll go from there. And while we start, can I ask you, even just to test if the chat function works, uh, can you write your name and where you're from in the chat so I can have a look? Right, so we've got someone from Dubai. Oh, actually, it's you, Lukman. <laughs> Look at the name afterwards. <laughs> and I believe Simon here is joining us from London and I'm here in the UK as well, but in a tiny village called Worcester. Maybe not tiny village, but. The chat is very quiet. Nobody wants to share. <laughs> don't be afraid. And of course, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, Lukman and Simon, ha she can share a wealth of knowledge. So um, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this, learn from them. Oh, we've got Jan, uh, Jan from Sweden. And yeah, um, I'm sure everyone will be able to learn a lot of or get a lot of insights from these two brains. Hello, Peter. Where are you watching the webinar, webinar today? Oh, and Michael from rainy New Jersey. <laughs> okay, and Peter is also from Sweden. And then we've got Brazil. We're pretty much all over the world today. And Yoon in UK as well.
Right. Uh, fantastic. So I'll just reintroduce everything for everyone that just joined, and then I'm going to mute myself and let Lukman and Simon talk today. So I am Chiara. I will be your host. Um, today, Simon and Lukman will be talking about um, the secrets of Java runtime, how to choose them for Jakarta EE applications. Um, Drop your questions in the chat throughout the entire session. I'll be monitoring them so we can answer pretty much in real time. Um, and yeah, enjoy the discussion. Okay, thank you, Kiara. So everybody, welcome. Hello from uh, sunny Dubai. Quite uh, hot here. Hello to everybody. And uh, nice to have you here, Simon. Today we're going to talk about Java and um, a bit of a point across the, the Java ecosystem for me is always very amazing. Way back when I started, I was quite dazzled by the acronyms from <laughs> JSR to JDK to uh, JCP to it's nearly everything on the Java platform is an acronym. So I think we should start from the top, Simon, and uh, discuss the, the, the component of the Java runtime. What exactly is the Java runtime? Right. Yes. JDK, so, JRE. What exactly are, are these terms? Yes. So, so it is as you say. It's uh, Java is one of these sort of very heavily overloaded terms, isn't it? We talk about Java in general, and it actually means multiple different things all at the same time. So, you can think of the Java platform as being a combination of several things. Uh, primarily, you've got the Java language, and that's what we use to develop our applications. And when we're talking about Java EE then we're going to be enterprise Java applications and we're talking about servlets, we're talking about enterprise Java beans and components like that. So you've got the language that you can use with libraries and frameworks and so on. But then you need something to actually execute that on. And the big difference, as I'm sure everybody is aware, is that when we compile Java, we don't compile it into native code or Typically, we don't. We'll probably come back to that later on. Um, typically, we don't compile it into native code. We compile it into bytecodes. And in order for those bytecodes to run the application, they need to be converted into the necessary instructions for whichever platform we're running on. And that's where this thing called the JVM comes in. So first acronym. Mm -hmm. So the Java Virtual Machine, and that's the sort of lowest level part of Java, is where we take those bytecodes and we determine how to convert them into the necessary instructions. And that happens in, in several stages. So you've got the idea of interpreting them uh, when they start. So you take each instruction, you convert it to a set of instructions, and then you run it. But then over time, what we do is we use another acronym, which is called JIT, just-in-time compilation. And just-in-time compilation says, when we find that there are particular methods that are used frequently, rather than having to go through the bytecodes every time, we'll take that method and we'll pass it to a compiler, compile it into native instructions and have that run to give us better performance. And over time, more and more methods will be compiled until we've got all the frequently used methods being done. And in terms of the, the sort of higher level picture of the runtime, we talk about the JDK a lot, another three letter acronym. So the Java Development Kit. And that consists really of Again, several things. So you've got the JVM, which is what runs the application, but then you've also got these very powerful libraries, all of the standard classes. And uh, I think if I remember rightly, there's somewhere around four and a half, maybe nearly 5,000 classes now in the standard class libraries, which gives you a very rich a set lot. of... It, it is, yes. That's why in JDK 9, we had to break it up into more manageable pieces and more the modularity nice. came in. Because having all those in one library was was just unmanageable. So we have a very rich set of functionality and makes it a lot easier for us to develop our applications. And then obviously we've got the Java EE side of things, or Jakarta EE as I should really probably call it now, um, which is another set of libraries that's built on top of that. Um, one thing that, that people also kind of hear a lot about, and you mentioned this, is the JRE, the Java Runtime Environment. And it's quite important to understand the distinction there. If you look at sort of older versions of Java, and I'm talking about JDK 8 and earlier, we had this thing called the JRE. And the JRE, Java Runtime Environment, was a subset of the JDK. Because the JDK being the development kit, what that means is you've got all the tools and the things that you need to develop software. 
but that gives you more than you need to actually run the software. So the JRE was the idea. It's just okay. what you need to run your application. Just the Java executable, the libraries, and a few other bits and pieces. Now, in JDK 9, in addition to introducing modularity, they did away with the JRE. And the reason behind that was that by having modules, we now have the ability to create a runtime which is specific to an application. And you can say, right, let's just let's build a runtime with only the modules that I need. And that replaces the JRE in effect, because the JRE was, was just for all applications. Now we can build a, a runtime which is specific to a given application. We'll look and, and analyze which modules are required from the, the, the JDK, put those all together, strip out anything else needed. And that can really make things very, very small. Um, if you look at a standard JDK, sort of like JDK 9 onwards, you're probably talking about 300 megabytes in size. If you strip out everything and you take really the simplest possible application, just sort of printing things out, you can reduce that to less than 30 megabytes. Clearly, as you add more things okay. in and, and do real work, it gets a bit bigger. But you can see that there's there's a lot that can be removed to minimize the size of the runtime. And when we get into you know the idea of having components and Jakarta EE, that's a, a very useful thing to be able to do. So that's that's nice. really kind of the run so, in a nutshell. Nice. So if I understand correctly, the, the term Java is much more an umbrella term encompassing different technologies than it is a single thing. Yes. Okay. Nice. Nice. And yeah. for a language that has been there since ninety seven or so, it might have uh, a lot of uh, misconceptions about exactly what it is, especially within the context of the JDK and the different implementations out there. So if Java is an umbrella term, how does that relate to the various JDKs we have? And there's quite a number of them out there. Mm -hmm. for, for a lay person, for an, a new developer to the platform, what exactly are all these? Right. So one of the nice things about Java, uh, the platform, <laughs> is that it has a standard associated with it. And that, that we can get into some more of those acronyms that you talked about. So when Sun created Java, they obviously released it and they updated it for a while. And people were very keen for them to make it more open so that people could understand about how it was being developed and what the features are going to be and things like that. And one of the key things that they wanted was a standard which showed people what actually goes into Java. So they created that, and that's called the Java Community Process. So the JCP is all about creating the standards for different aspects of Java. Now, originally, that covered everything in terms of Java. So it was the, the, the Java platform, the Java runtime, and also um, where Jakarta EE came from was the, the Java EE side of things, so the enterprise edition of Java. And they even had Java micro edition as well, back in the days when Java used to run on mobile yeah. phones. But the great thing about the JCP is that for each version of Java, there is what's called a Java specification request, or JSR. Okay. Another three-letter yes. acronym. Yep. So we've got lots of those. So we have a JSR. And a JSR consists of a specification for the Java platform. And that in itself consists of three things. So you have a definition of the Java language syntax so that you know exactly which keywords are used and, and how you actually lay out the, the code that you write so that the compiler can compile it. Okay. You have a Java virtual machine specification, which says these are the bytecodes that we have in the instruction set. This is what each bytecode does. Um, various other things about how the Java virtual machine has to work. And then the third part is the list of all the libraries which are included as the standard. So that's that four and a half, nearly 5,000 libraries are all listed in the specification. So that's really good. So now we've got a, a very um, clear comprehensive definition of what Java actually is. But then there's also a couple of other things that you get with that. First is that you get a reference implementation. Idea behind that is that you can say, okay, well, we've, we've created a specification, but let's prove that we can actually implement it. So we could create something that, you know, simply isn't possible to, to actually write. So we can, we have reference implementation and that's what's called the open JDK, open source version of Java. 
So you can go to OpenJDK, you can download the source code to the reference implementation of Java, and you can look at how it works and you can compile it and you can build your own runtime. And then the third part, which is also very, very important and another three letter acronym is TCK, the Technology Compatibility Kit. What that gives you is a very comprehensive set of tests and there's over a hundred thousand tests which you have to pass every single one of them to show that what you've created in terms of a Java runtime matches the specification. Now, in the case of OpenJDK, that's pretty straightforward because it's the reference implementation. So we know that it matches the specification. You can then build it and you can run the TCK on it and you're pretty guaranteed it'll pass because it, it is the specification. But what it also means is that other people can create alternative implementations of Java, which behave in the same way from a functional point of view. And um, by that, I mean that it, you've got all the same bytecode supported, uh, all the same libraries are there. So everything will, will run in exactly the same way. If you run your application, you know, it will print things at a certain time. It will do whatever the application is supposed to do. But what you can do is you can modify how that implementation works internally so that even though that from a functional perspective everything is exactly the same but you can modify how it runs the application and several people have done that the, the first people really who did, did that was IBM and IBM created a, a clean room implementation of Java called J9 that clean room meant that they didn't look at the open JDK source at all. They only looked at the specification and they wrote their version of Java just based on the specification. Other people like Azul have also done a similar thing. But what we did was rather than starting completely from scratch and saying, let's write a, a completely different JVM, we said, let's take open JDK, but let's replace certain parts of the JVM internally to deliver better performance. What we did there was look at things like garbage collection, and we created a, a pauseless garbage collector so you don't get the uh, impact of okay. pauses associated with collecting objects that aren't being used anymore. And we also replaced part of the JIT compilation system so that we could have one that would generate more heavily optimized code and therefore get better throughput and better performance for the same application. So even the application does exactly the same thing because it passes TCK, the performance you'll get will be different. So ideally you get better performance running the same application without having to make any changes to your code or even having to recompile. So that this is the, the key thing here is that you can have different implementations of the same specification and get different performance characteristics, even though the, the way that the code actually is executed is identical. And that's very important because it means you can switch between different implementations without having to worry about changing your code or recompiling. Nice. Wow. Okay. So essentially these uh, various JDKs are there an implementation of, of the Java standard and they pass the TCK and differ in their actual backend implementation. So like Azul uh, has a lot of optimizations in their implementation and that is pretty much the differences. Okay. That's great. So it, this is pretty much not uh, uh, different from the Java EE world where, or Jakarta EE, where you have the Jakarta EE specification, and then you have the various implementations like Payara and the others out there that define in terms of performance and other optimizations in the actual implementation. Exactly, yes. You see, that, that's the great thing about having a well-defined standard is that people can rely on the fact that, that if they write their applications to that standard. And as you say, so if you look at the Jakarta EE uh, specification, what you've got is a, a clear specification of what a servlet is, what the interfaces are to that. You've got a clear implementation or definition of what the enterprise Java beans are. And, and then you can go and write your code according to that. And then the idea is that having compiled that, you know, you can run it on Pyara, you can run it on um, Glassfish, you can run it on, I guess, Pyara and Glassfish, the same thing, but um, but you get the idea. So you can write it on different application servers without having to change your code. So it's taking it up to the next level of compatibility at that in doing that. Mike is asking, uh, 
Nicola, Nicolia Palog from Oracle once descend between JDK versus Java. But of course, I forgot what that was. When you mentioned the reference implementation, could that be the difference between the two? Um, Mike is asking a question in the in the Q and A and in the chat. Uh, all right, yeah, hang on, Q and A. Right, uh, once descend between JDK versus Java. Of course, I forgot that was. And the reference implementation could be there. Ah, right. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Um, the, the the thing to get across there is that that Java, as I said, is a sort of very encompassing term because we talk about Java the language, and we talk about Java the virtual machine. We talk about Java the runtime, uh, and so on. So, the JDK is the Java development kit, and that's sort of like the all of the things that you need to develop and run. Java applications. And from that, you can create a simplified runtime, as I said, from JDK 9 onwards, right. which will then allow you to run your applications without having the compiler and things like that. So, so Java means several different things at the same time, but the JDK is the Java development kit, which is really everything you need to run your applications. Hopefully that makes that clear. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so if these implementations of Java differ in their uh, implementations based on the optimizations they make, as a Jakarta EE or Enterprise Java developer, what are some benchmarks or metrics I should look out for in the in the various runtimes out there when I'm adopting a Java runtime for my production workload? Right. Yeah. So, so this is this is where obviously you you need to get into the idea of understanding how well things perform, and the, there's different sort of metrics that you can look at. So, one of the obvious ones is looking at how how much sort of uh, throughput you get, and what I mean by that really is transactions per second. And you can set that up in terms of uh, creating benchmarks for your application, and say, okay, well we use a load generator, push the load onto your your Java your Jakarta EE application, and then see how many transactions per second you can get in a for a given workload and see how that actually scales. So obviously transactions per second is is one very key metric that you can have there. Um, and as we sort of discussed earlier, the, the idea of having different implementations of things like JIT compilation between J9 or OpenJDK, Hotspot, um, Azul's, uh, what we call our Zing JVM, will give you different performance characteristics, which may lead to better or may lead to worse performance, depending on how things actually go. Hopefully you get better performance with um, the choice of JVM that you use. Um, the other thing that you can do in terms of um, analyzing performance is looking at how latency affects things. And that's different to throughput because what we're dealing with there is, is dealing is talking about the idea of how long do we have to wait for a response from our system. Now that can be partly related to the number of transactions per second, but often it's related to other things as well. And I, I mentioned, you know, garbage collection. So if you look at typical garbage collection algorithms, they will stop application threads whilst they do their work. And they have to do that to do their work safely. Because if you're going through marking which objects are live, you don't want people changing objects and creating new objects while you're doing that. Similarly, if you're trying to move objects around in the heap to uh, eliminate fragmentation, you don't want people changing those objects because you can lose those changes and that leads to very big problems. So most algorithms, simple algorithms, start off with the idea of pausing applications while they do the work, do it safely. Now, we've seen a lot more algorithms come through uh, recently. So our one called C4 um, is a truly pauseless garbage collector. There are other more modern ones that you get in Hotspot, like uh, ZGC, you may have heard of, and Shenandoah is another one that attempts to improve the, the way that the garbage collection works. So from a latency perspective, you then need to look at, well, how can we monitor that? One of the things that we did at Azul is we, we kind of figured out how can we analyze the performance of an application without evolving the application, which might sound kind of counterintuitive, but it's, it's actually quite clever um, and very simple. What we said was, right, okay, let's put a, an extra thread in the JVM that's running your application, but that thread will not interact 
with the application at all. And what the thread will do is it will go to sleep for one millisecond. It's going to spend most of its time asleep, so we don't have to worry about this thread interfering with the performance of the application itself. We put the thread to sleep for one millisecond, and then when it wakes up, what we do is we look at what the time is when we wake up, because we recorded the time when we went to sleep. And if something happens which prevents our thread from waking up, so let's say a garbage collection pause kicks in and it takes 20 milliseconds. When our thread wakes up, it's going to be 20 milliseconds later rather than one millisecond later. And we can record that difference every time we do this. And then we can build up a graph, a histogram, of all of the data to show how the application is being affected by the JVM. And that's garbage collection, it's latency associated with the operating system, the hardware, everything below the application. So you're not looking at what's involved in terms of the application pausing because it's doing some work internally. It's what impact the JVM has on the application. And this is a thing called, called J Hiccup. It's open source. Um, you can go to our website. You can find a link to it. Um, it's on GitHub. Um, you can download it and run it. And like I say, it's a very simple thing, but it's very useful for showing how performance works in terms of the JVM interacting with your application, but ignoring the application and, and what the application is actually doing. So it's, it's very useful in that sense. So throughput is one thing. Latency is, is another thing. Okay, so these are all uh, things to, to consider. I believe things like startup time, memory footprint are also uh, very important in considering the various implementations out there. That's right, yes. So again, with, with Java, what you've got is a different performance profile, a very different performance profile to what you get with more traditional languages like C and C++. Um, with those kind of languages, because you do compile to native code, when you start up, you essentially get full performance immediately. You get 100% level of performance because there is nothing that's going to change in terms of that code as the application runs. But because Java starts off with bytecodes and then identifies these methods that are used very frequently and then uses the JIT compiler to compile them as the code runs, it has a different performance characteristic. And you start off with the application running quite slowly, and it has this warm-up time that's associated with an application. So that warm-up time will be as we identify those methods, we compile them. And there's even more to it than that because there's two phases of compilation. There's, there's what's called the very imaginatively C1 compiler, and then the also very imaginatively called C2 JIT compiler. So the first one just compiles code very quickly, but doesn't apply any optimizations to the code. What we then do is profile that code as it's being used. So as the method is called, we look at how it works. And then we, when we get to another threshold in terms of how many times that method is being called, we pass it to the C2JIT compiler, or in the case of Azul, what we call Falcon. And that will then recompile the code, but using the profiling information to generate much more heavily optimized code. And we can do all sorts of interesting things, uh, what are called speculative optimizations, to really try and get the best possible level of performance out of the code. And so that warm up time is, is very important. And that will vary depending on the runtime that's selected, because depending on which JIT compiler you've got, it may take longer to um, warm up, it may take shorter time to warm up, or you may find that it'll take a little bit longer to warm up, but the overall level of performance you're gonna get is actually higher than the level of performance you get with a different JIT compiler. So these things, warm up time and overall level of performance will, will vary based on the, um, the implementation that's used. Similarly, as you said, the memory footprint, although typically the memory footprint doesn't vary so much with um, a JVM because the, the code that's being used will be the same, but you can see some differences, in, again, in terms of that JIT compilation, you may get bigger pieces of code. So you'll have okay. a slightly make bigger memory footprint versus other ones that might be slightly smaller. Okay. And these are the technical aspects. I also believe there is the business or commercial aspects like licensing and support models to consider for all the various uh, implementations of the uh, Yes. Yeah. So the, the, the commercial side of things that yeah gets gets very interesting as well because um again if you sort of look at the history of Java, 
we started off with some microsystems who made Java freely available. And the only time you had to pay to use Java was if you were using an embedded system or like a mobile phone type of application. Everything else, Java was free. And when Oracle acquired Sun Microsystems way back in 2010, they continued to do the same thing. Since then, they've actually made some changes to the way that they licensed the Oracle JDK. And now if you're using it in a, a commercial situation, then you do need to pay for a support contract with the Oracle JDK. So that's one thing. There are now many more versions of, or distributions, I should say, of OpenJDK available. And those are both free and come with commercial support. So um, in terms of um, as all, we have a community edition of the Zulu JDK that we have. So that one is free. You can use that without any cost. But then we also provide commercial support around ours, which you can pay for. Um, it's a lower price than Oracle. Same thing with our Prime JVM. Um, that comes with commercial support. And because it's a, a different implementation, it's a commercial product. So there are different licensing and pricing models involved in all those different sorts of things. So the, the decision about which runtime to use really comes down to a combination of what cost is involved, but also what performance characteristics you're getting from that. And you have to sort of balance the, the cost versus the, the performance and so on that you get plus the support. Because if you're using a free version, that's great doesn't cost much doesn't cost any money but of course if you have a problem with a free version then who do you call because there may not be anybody as a support organization that you can just ring up and say right i want to be able to do this is the same with with like pyara because of course you're providing support around jakarta ee um, for people who are running commercial applications they need that support and they need to be able to call somebody up and say okay something's not working in quite the way that we expect it to can you help us fix that problem and so your support people will do the same thing with jakarta ee as we will do with the java underlying runtime system. Um, Cara, I, I think believe... there's a question, right? Yes, I believe there's a question from Uma. Um, does this affect any Java SE and Java EE edition? Um, Uma, do you mean regarding the JDK or something else? Right, yeah, because the I mean, to, to talk a little bit about that. So Java SE is the Java standard edition, and that's the the core Java runtime. So that, as I said, is the JVM specification, the Java language specification, and the list of all the Java libraries. Java EE, or Jakarta EE as it's now called, that is all of the enterprise level specifications which sit on top of the application server, which define the the enterprise Java beans, the servlets, so on, or the transaction APIs, the security APIs, all of those things are part of the Jakarta EE specification. So they're, they're two distinct sets of specifications, one for the core Java platform and one for the enterprise side of things. Yeah, um, Uma, Java EE and Java SE have always been confusing but you can think of them as uh, two siblings with Java SE being the, the, the smaller sibling and Java EE being the much bigger uh, brother for doing a lot more things in an enterprise setting. But uh, pretty much all of them are built on the JDK because again, it's Java, but as uh, Simon has educated us on, Java means many things in, in, in different contexts. So. Java SE is the base language, and Java EE is the one with a lot more uh, specifications or APIs for developing enterprise applications. OK, Simon, back to uh, analyzing the runtimes for production systems. We've looked at the technical aspect and then also the business uh, aspect, which is licensing and, and support. Now, if I'm also considering a runtime for uh, production application on, on Jakarta EE, for instance, in terms of the Java SE, I would want to think about uh, security. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a bit on, on security, how the implementations differ on security as well? 
Yeah, you see, that that is a very good point. Um, obviously, you know, we, we find that a lot of software, you know, people are, are very keen to try and attack software and extract information and, and run sort of denial of service attacks and things like that. So if we look at the Java platform specifically, um, how that works is that OpenJDK is the, the reference implementation for the standard and it is the open source version of Java. Now, what we get is four updates each year to the Java platform. So they happen in January, April, July, and October. And as part of that, what you get are a set of security patches and then lots of bug fixes and maybe some small performance improvements and things like that. To develop those security patches, there is a, a group within OpenJDK, a subgroup called the OpenJDK Vulnerability Group. And that was set up by Oracle when they made some of the licensing changes um, and decided that there would probably be more distributions of Java. And they said, we want to make sure that Java has security as much as possible. We want all distributions to be as secure as possible. So they invited various people to join this vulnerability group. Um, I myself am actually on the on the group. There's other engineers at Azul. There's people from Red Hat, SAP, from Amazon, from Microsoft. Um, really, all of the sort of big companies that deliver Java versions will have engineers who work on this, this group. And what we do is we work together collaboratively to develop the security patches to what are called CVEs, common vulnerabilities and exposures, which are reported against uh, Java. Now, even though this is an open source project, because we're dealing with very sensitive information about vulnerabilities which haven't yet been resolved, and so could be used as exploits against an unpatched Java system, we keep all of that information completely private. So there is no sharing of information outside of the group. Everything that we communicate within the group is done through encrypted email. And as I say, we don't publish any information about that. That means that only when an update comes out will information about those CVEs be revealed. But we only reveal information about CVEs that we now have a patch for, which means that as a user, you can say, right, I'm going to take the update, I'm going to install it on my machine, and then I've resolved those things so that those CVEs are no longer a vulnerability that can be exploited by people uh, who know about these things. So one of the things that's really uh, important to get across about this is that you should look every quarter at the updates that come out for Java and make sure that um, you're seeing, okay, what level of um, CVEs are being delivered here or uh, solutions to CVEs are being delivered because the, the way that they get categorized is using a, a scale of um, zero to 10. And this is what's called the CVSS, Common Vulnerability Scoring System. And that tells you how dangerous potentially that vulnerability is. If you've got a 9.0 to a 10.0, that's a critical vulnerability. It's one that you know can be exploited very easily, um, can result in loss of data or denial of service. Um, you've got high, which is sort of 7.0 to 9. You've got medium, which is uh, 4.0 to 7, and less than 4 is a, is a low. So what you need to do is look at how many vulnerabilities are being fixed in that update and then say to yourself, well, okay, if there's a critical vulnerability, you definitely need to get that patch installed as quickly as possible. Or if there's maybe only a couple of low ones, then sure, you can wait a while because it's not really going to be that uh, critical an issue. Um, but it is very important to look at that and really deploy those patches as quickly as possible. One of the nice things about having that group that works together is that the people on that group have access to the information about what's going on so that we can develop okay. the backporting of because the the, the 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 fixes are only developed for the current version of java what we then need to do is backport them to older what are called long-term support releases and then have those made available so by doing that we can provide updates to uh, in the case of azul we can provide updates to our version of Java within an hour of when the update is released. So you can make sure your systems are very secure. And I believe we've got a couple of questions. Okay. So the first one is on the subject of licensing. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a significant move away from official Oracle Java, for example, JDK 1.8, uh, since the new li licensing rules uh, based on uh, the organization headcount came into effect? 
uh, it seems to present a significant opportunity for a company like Azul. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and and I will say that I, I I do have to thank Oracle greatly for for doing this because you're absolutely right. Yes, um, by changing the the licensing terms and conditions and uh, meaning that people who are using Java in a commercial situation uh, now have to pay for a commercial support contract, which calls Java SE subscription from Oracle. And last year they also changed the way that they do their pricing, which was kind of interesting because rather than price it based on how many processes or how many cores you had running your, let's say, enterprise application, uh, or how many desktops you had with, with people sharing those desktops. They said, well, let's simplify this. And let's simply say that all you have to calculate for your price is how many people you employ. So that's full-time employees, part-time employees, contractors, and even anybody from a third-party company that's supporting your Java applications. So if you're working in an environment where, let's say you're a, a shop, you know, a supermarket, for example, you have thousands of employees, most of whom have nothing to do with Java applications, uh, your bill becomes very, very big. So yes, you, you're absolutely right that uh, we're seeing quite a significant shift. And if you look at the Gartner reports, for example, they will say that uh, there is a, a very um, a significant shift away from using or the standard Oracle Java, or I shouldn't say the standard Java, the Oracle Java to alternatives because they are compatible. Because we TCK test our Java in the same way that Oracle does, we know that we have a drop-in replacement. We know that it's identical from a functional point of view. So it's very easy for people to make that migration and that switch. So yes, we're, we're certainly seeing that uh, lots of customers are making that, that switch away from Oracle Java to using our own Java, but also other people as well. You know, um, As I said, there, there are lots of different distributions available. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is, do you have any idea whether Eclipse Foundation are planning to set up a certification path for Jakarta E? Now, is that a question for me or for Lukman? I think open to uh, anyone that has the answer. <laughs> well, uh, Ashraf, I, I think you should, uh, this is a good question. Uh, something that uh, you can actually ask, uh, or, sorry, <laughs> Eclipse directly on the mailing list. As far as I know, there is no such plan afoot, but it, it's a good question. You can actually bring it up to uh, Eclipse in the mailing list. If you are not part of the mailing list, feel free to join. The, the, the barest minimum you can do for the community is to be part of the mailing list and ask these kind of questions and bring these up. Who knows, maybe you could kickstart a storm that will uh, give Eclipse ideas on uh, setting up certifications and all that. But I agree with you, uh, having certifications for Jakarta EE is a good idea. So uh, share this on the mailing list with Eclipse and then we can, we can discuss it over there. Fantastic, thank you, Lukman. Um, one more question for the several JVM implementations. Are there differences in the instrumentation and monitoring capabilities of the G JMV itself and the Java applications on running in the JVM? Right, yes. So um, a lot of instrumentation is, is nice and standard. Um, so there are things called JMX, or there is a thing called JMX, the Java Management Extensions. And a lot of instrumentation can plug into the JMX interface. And that means that because JMX is part of the standard in the JVM, it's very easy because you can say, well, okay, I'm using JMX to instrument my JVM and collect information from that. So I can just use the same JMX interface on, let's say the Azul JVM versus the Oracle JVM or OpenJDK JVM or, or J9. So all of that will work in exactly the same way. There are more sophisticated tools. So one of the uh, the very common ones that is used a lot is things like uh, Java Flight Recorder and Java Mission Control. Flight Recorder is built into the uh, the JDK and the JVM that collects the information about what's happening in the, the JVM. And then Mission Control is, is a sort of dashboard graphical tool that analyzes that information and can show you what was going on when your application was running. Now, um, initially, that was classed as a commercial feature um, by Oracle. So up until JDK 11, um, Java Flight Recorder wasn't included in the open source version of Java. JDK 11, Oracle decided that they would contribute the Flight Recorder code to the JDK, open JDK, and so that became a standard part of that. What 
Azul did was we said, well, we really like that. That's great. What we'll do is we'll take advantage of how open source works. We'll take the flight recorder code from JDK 11 and we'll backport it to open JDK 8 so that anybody who wants to use JDK 8 can then use flight recorder on there. So we did that. And now mm -hmm. everybody has access to flight recorder on JDK 8 or JDK 11 and later, which means that you can use those tools in exactly the same way. Um, again, like with our platform prime JVM, you can use flight recorder with that. There's no problem. We also provide additional tooling um, so that we, because we do things slightly differently internally with our garbage collector and our JIT compiler. So we have also an additional tool that people can use to collect information about that, but that's a sort of non-standard one. Plenty of standard ways of doing things that will work across all different implementations. So the good news is yes, you, you have access to those tools. Okay. Nice. So again, uh, stepping or uh, rolling back a bit to the issue of security, I believe the security fixes that come out uh, for for the paid versions, you backport them to older versions. I believe so. That's right. Yes. Yes. Um. Oh. But 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 it, it's uh, <laughs> a little bit more complicated than that. So yes, we 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 do backport those versions. Now, in the case of Azul, we go all the way back to JDK six. Um, that was the first version of Java that, well, it actually technically wasn't the first version of Java, um, but essentially we can say it's the first version of Java that was open source. So JDK 6, in our case, JDK 6, JDK 7, JDK 8, JDK 11, JDK 17, and now JDK 21, because those are all the long-term support versions of Java. Um, so we, we backport all of those. Now, from a, a commercial perspective, um, what we we all of those changes um, from eight onwards, six and seven, um, because we only do that for commercial customers, um, from eight onwards, they all get contributed to the OpenJDK repositories because those versions of Java are still being maintained in the open source project. So what we do is we contribute those changes or, or other people like SAP and uh, Red Hat do a lot of the work as well. They get contributed to the relevant OpenJDK repositories so that everybody can then build from those. One of the key things about that is really how quickly you get access to those changes when an update is released. As I said, because the way that we do things for our commercial customers, we have our updates so far available within one hour of when the update is released. Some um, distributions will take maybe a few hours, a few days, um, in the extreme, it could be a couple of weeks before you get access to those updates. So that's another big consideration when you're looking at a distribution is how quickly do you get access to those updates? And, and one other small thing to mention as well is that from the Oracle JDK perspective, they provide two versions of each update. It's what's called in Oracle terminology, the CPU and the PSU. CPU is the critical patch update, and that only includes the security patches. PSU is the patch set update, and that security patches plus everything else. So bug fixes, performance improvements. Now, the, the relevance of having a CPU and a PSU is that if there's a critical vulnerability that needs to be addressed very quickly, what you want is the smallest possible set of changes to avoid any potential impact on the stability of your application. Good example of that is like a couple of years ago, we had an update and that included a bug fix, which was in the PSU, but not in the CPU. Now that bug fix fixed one particular problem that had been reported, but unfortunately it then introduced a new bug, which prevented certain things like, um, what was it? Hadoop, Cluster, Solar, and Lucene wouldn't even start with that update installed. So the, the, the issue was that if you had a critical vulnerability, I think it was a high vulnerability, that particular update, um, then you could still deploy the CPU, run your applications and wait for the fix to the fix. Um, and the Oracle do that and Azul do that. So we're the only people other than Oracle who provide both of those updates. Um, so yeah, that, that's security wise, you have to consider those things. Okay. Even in the security room, there's a lot of acronyms, CPU, <laughs> Yes, PSU. CPU, PSU, yes. <laughs> And we've got one more Sarah, question. A question. Yes, yep. from Diego. What are the key performance metrics or benchmarks that organizations should consider when evaluating different JVM options? 
Yes. So that, that kind of comes back to what I said before. The, the, there's sort of really two fundamental metrics that you need to look at from the JVM perspective. One is throughput and the other is latency. So through, well, actually, no, let's say three. <laughs> I said two, let's say three. So one is um, throughput. So that's how many transactions per second you can deal with. And that comes down to the the code that's generated by the JIT compiler, how heavily is it optimized? Um, what ways can we use to get the most performance out of the code? So that that's one metric that you would use is transactions per second, how many, uh, how much throughput you can get in terms of the application. Second one is latency, which is, you know, how much delay you get in responding to a particular transaction request. And that comes down to, like I said, things like garbage collection is a big impact on latency typically. So if you can eliminate that, you eliminate a lot of the latency. Um, and then the third thing is what we talked about with warm up. So you could say that measuring how long it takes to get to the optimum level of performance would be another metric that you could use to analyze how well an implementation works. And so again, what we've done at Azul is we include a thing called uh, ready now. And what that does is it says, rather than running your application, going through the warm up process, and then running your application again, have to go through exactly the same warm up process of identifying the methods, compiling them, recompiling them, and so on. When you've got your application, let's take a Jakarta EE application, you've got your application up and running, it's all running nicely. You can then take a profile of the JVM underneath, and that will tell the system, uh, record all the information about which classes are loaded, which classes are initialized, the profiling data that was collected by the JIT compiler and the JIT compiled code. When you start your application again, rather than have to start from scratch, you say, okay, start my application with this profile. And immediately we can then say, right, let's load all these classes, let's initialize all these classes. And we know immediately which methods to compile. We already have compiled okay. code, so we, we can reuse that where we can. And that will greatly reduce the warm-up time that's associated with an application. And that's really good when you're starting the same application frequently. And again, if we think about an enterprise application where you're using you know, multiple servlets, multiple EJBs uh, that are doing the same thing, and you want multiple instances of those to do load balancing, that's a really good way of, of improving the startup time by using that ReadyNow profile to, to reduce the amount of warm-up time that's involved. So three things, nice. um, yeah, latency, throughput, and warm-up time. Warm-up time, okay. Uh, we've seen things to consider. You've educated us on things to consider. What are pitfalls to watch out for when when picking a runtime for, for production? Um, yeah, it's there's not a great deal, I think, when, when it comes to that. I mean, when you're migrating, let's say you want to migrate from one... Uh, Java distribution to another Java distribution, and you're looking at different runtime with different performance characteristics. Clearly, the the obvious thing to to do is to say, let's make sure that whichever runtime we want to use has passed all of the TCK tests. Because if you do that, then you've got that very high level of confidence that you don't need to worry about your application um, behaving differently in terms of what it actually does versus the performance, which will hopefully be improved but in terms of what the application does it will still be the same so that that's one thing is to make sure that you're moving to another tck tested version of the java runtime but i think the other thing that's worth uh thinking about is if you're going to make a migration uh to a different runtime don't also at the same time think to yourself oh, i'm running on jdk 8 at the moment i know i'll update jdk 17 as well or jdk 21 so i'll get the latest version of java plus this new runtime because that could be considered too many changes at the same time what you really want what you really want to do is say okay i'm running jdk 8 at the moment let's move to that new runtime tck tested but we'll still use jdk 8 make sure everything works exactly as we expect it to and then we can make the switch to a newer version like 17 or, or 21 um, and do the testing again to make sure that there aren't any difficulties there because obviously there are lots of changes in terms of the java platform itself between JDK 8 and 11 and 17 and 21. And those might have 
an impact on what your application does and, and how it works. Um, backwards compatibility is very, very good in Java, but there are certain situations where that might be something you need to, to look okay. at. Okay, we are heading towards the top of the hour, so we might want to uh, start uh, ramping down. Uh, we can talk about Java now without talking about the cloud. How does the, the growth of cloud architectures influence the way uh, we think about Java today, and how do you see it in the future? Mm. Yeah. So, so yeah. This this is a very interesting thing because, as you say, we're we're seeing an enormous amount of um, what we, you could describe as lift and shift into the cloud. So, people taking applications they're running in their data center and move them into the cloud. And what's interesting is that we often see when people do that. Often, we we, we definitely see cases where people think that they're going to save money by moving to the cloud. They move away from the capital expenditure of providing hardware in their own operating uh, data center, having to do all the maintenance and stuff like that. Let somebody like AWS deal with that, and we'll just pay for what we use. But then they find they're actually paying more in their cloud bill than they are when they run it in their data center. And that's really as a result of, of not necessarily thinking about how you're moving to the cloud and, and re-architecting things potentially. Um, one of the great things about uh, Jakarta EE is the ability to to have uh, you know components that you use within your application, and you can use multiple instances of a component. So you you need to think about how to get the best throughput for that. And one of those uh, ideas behind, like I said, with Ready Now is the ability to to start up a new instance of uh, let's say Enterprise Java Bean or Servlet and be able to do that very quickly so that you can respond to those changing loads. And we do see people who, to get around that problem, rather than solving the problem itself, they say, well, let's start up lots of instances of this particular bean and then keep those running in the background so that we've got them available when we want to use them. But of course, if you keep them running in the background, you're paying to run something which isn't actually being used. So try to avoid that um, in terms of the, the building your cloud bill. The other thing that we've done is we, we've kind of looked at this from a Java perspective, and we, we've done some interesting things where we said, okay, well, if we're running in the cloud, how can we take advantage of that? Think of the cloud as like an, an infinite compute resource. And what we did was we looked at the, um, the way that the JVM works. And again, coming back to this JIT compilation, and we said, well, why, why don't we, rather than having each JVM running its own JIT compilation and having to potentially repeat a lot of work, what we'll do is we'll extract the JVM out of the, sorry, extract the JIT compiler out of the JVM, decouple it, and make that into a centralized service. So in the same way you have infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, let's have JIT as a service. And that's what we call the cloud native compiler. And by doing that, we can have different JVMs share the same JIT compiler, and that way we can um, have reduced amount of resources in each of the JVMs that we're running, and then also the ability to cache code so that when a, a same enterprise Java Beam, for example, starts up, you've got the code already available, and it can be immediately shipped to that uh, JVM so it can run the application without having to do the, the warm-up and stuff like that. So there's lots of things that we can do there. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of interesting things that can be done in the cloud. There is one question from Carlos. Uh, tell us more about CRAC. How does it ah, work? Ah, yes. <laughs> 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 yes. So, so uh, Java on crack. Um, we're definitely going to have to come up with a different marketing name for this. Um, <laughs> yeah, yes, crack that's, is. <laughs> that's the first thing. Yeah. So, so what we've done there is again, it, it relates back to the idea of um, startup time. So, I talked about um, ready now, where we take a profile of a running application, so that when you start it up again, you've got all the JIT compilation information readily, well, immediately available. What crack does is is take that sort of to the next level. And if you think about it, when you're running um, applications on your laptop, it's quite easy just to close the lid on the laptop, walk away, uh, take your laptop with you. And then when you get to the office or your home, wherever, you open the laptop up and everything is exactly as it was before. But when you close it, everything stops running, doesn't it? So what we said was, how about if we do that for the JVM? And the idea is that um, you can run your application have the application so it's all fully warmed up. You've got 
all of your data ready. So again, in your uh, Jakarta EE application, everything is running exactly as you want it to. You've got everything set up. Then what we do is we say, right, let's take a snapshot of that running application. And that's all the state. It's not just the JIT compilation. It's like uh, the heap, it's the um, stack, it's the registers, all of that sort of thing. So that when you want to start it up again, you, you take that snapshot, store it all in user level files, when you want to run the application again, rather than having to start it up from cold and going through all of the warm-up process and also the initialization of your Jakarta EE code, what you do is you simply say, right, take my stored data, my stored state, and reload it into the JVM and start from exactly that point. The What CRAC stands for is Coordinated Restore at Checkpoint. And it's built on top of um, some underlying um, Linux functionality. It's not doesn't rely on it, but it uses it at the moment. Called Cryo, Coordinated Restore in User Space. And the the important thing about what we do at the Java level is to enforce some rules because one of the complicated things is that if you think right, well, I'm going to freeze my application and then an hour later I'm going to restart the the same application at, at that exact point. If you've got open file descriptors, if you've got connections to databases, if you've got network connections that are open those potentially are going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to restore from that given state. So what we say is when you do a, a checkpoint, we will make the application aware that it's being checkpointed and any database connections, any network connections, file descriptions, and so on, you can close those. And then when you restore it, we make the application aware again that it's being restored. And you can then go through the reverse process and say, all oh, right, I need to reestablish a link to the database. I need to reestablish a network connection to this server. I need to open this file. And you can even do things like when you open a file, you can say, when I do the checkpoint, I'll create a ch uh, checksum of the file as it is now. When I need to open the file again, I do another checksum, compare the two. And if they've changed, I know I need to do additional work to, to reprocess that file. So there's lots of things you can do which make it much more reliable in terms of how the, the application can be restarted. And, and so, you know, with things like Jakarta EE, this is very powerful as a way of going, right, let's start my application server right from, you know, the exact point where we were running uh, before. So that's a very interesting piece of technology. It's not in... Um, Java as a standard feature yet, but we have contributed to OpenJDK as a separate project, and you have there are builds available on our website where you can get them and and play around with them. Okay, so Crack is essentially a way to take a snapshot mm -hmm. of everything, sort of, and put it in the freezer. And yes, it out exactly. Yes, and when you you need it. Okay, that's right. Okay, Kara, over to you. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm afraid we've pretty much run out of time. So um, I hope you were able to find answer to all the questions you had. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, just on a side note, because we were talking about enterprise level um, um, application server, if you want to try Payara Enterprise, you can register for free and give it a look. Um, and um, I think that's all for today. So thank you, Lukman. Thank you, Simon. Um, and uh, if you are interested in learning more about Jakarta EE um, and the Java word, the broad Java word, as we learned today, um, just uh, stay tuned and check out our latest webinars. Um, have a good rest of your day and see you soon. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>